I have an interesting question from uh, Suzanne from, from Concord, Mass, who uh, asks, is it a bad thing to play a bird call, such as a bluebird call, to try to encourage them to come to a feeder? Yeah, that's, that's the big question. Um, and it, um, I, I wrote about that on my blog about 10 years ago. Um, and the, it's, um, you are, you're changing the behavior of the bird. So if you play a recording of a bird's song, it, you're alter, going to alter that bird's behavior. They hear the recording, they think it's another bird, they come to investigate or to challenge or, or whatever. Um, you're luring them out of cover, luring them away from finding food or feeding their young or preening or whatever else they were doing. Let's get into this because uh, I know that I am dying to uh, start this conversation with uh, with David Allen Sibley and um, David, thank you so much for, uh, for for joining us again. David is author of the Sibley Guides to Birds, a Sibley Guide to Bird Life and Behavior, and uh, this new beautiful book. Uh, I, I have to keep to see, keep holding it up, David, because it is really a beautiful book. I'm one of those people that loves books as things and as an aesthetic object. It's it's fantastic. You can get it on on a, a Kindle or electronic version, but you want to get the one you can hold in your hands because the uh, illustrations are, are practically to to scale and they are they are gorgeous you want to have you want to have this thing david uh let me stop talking <laughs> and give you a chance to say uh hello thank you thank you it's great to be with you so the, the first thing that i wanted to ask you about uh, about this book uh is the evolution of the concept behind it uh because I, I i read uh i understand that you originally the concept was you had a, a book for children in mind yeah, it started almost 20 years ago as an idea, just kind of working working on ideas for a, a kid's book about birds, a, a kid's guide to birds. And obviously then it would include familiar backyard birds, the birds that um, kids are likely to see. And um, I wanted to include also um, more about the birds, what they're doing, how they live their lives, and and as I started researching those things, the the things I was learning were so amazing. I thought after 50 years of bird watching, I thought I knew a lot about birds. I was shocked at the things I was learning. A lot of stuff I thought I knew turned out to be wrong. And the, the real answer is is even more interesting and remarkable than than what I thought. I, well, I think I think a lot of us were were would be shocked to hear that David Allen Sibley had anything to learn <laughs> about birds, and uh, and the first thing when I when I heard about this book, uh, I, I thought, well, gosh, he's he's covered so much. I mean, the the Sibley Guide to Bird Life and Behavior, there there's so much in there about about how birds live, uh, but it turns out I've had a chance to look for this book now. There there is a lot more. Talk, talk about the gaps that you were trying to fill in that we didn't know existed. Yeah, so I mean, I, I started out, one of my, my goals was to um, try to answer a lot of the most common questions that I hear from people and, and questions from non-birders, you know, my, my family, neighbors, friends, um, questions like why do birds migrate, um, uh, you know, the, some really fundamental <laughs> basic questions, but, um, you know, are birds afraid of heights? Um, that kind of stuff. So, and it, and it was really fun to dig into the research and try to find answers to those. And every time I started working on one question, it would lead me the the research, the reading would lead me into all kinds of other things. I would think of other questions and learn other things. So, um, I just uh, you know the the answer to why birds migrate is it's basically a question of economics. They uh, <laughs> they're, they're essentially there's a lot of competition in the tropics where birds are resident all year. So their birds have staked out territories. They're there all year long. Um, there's not much chance of finding a gap where you can set up your own territory. Um, so that's what has 
it makes the northern hemisphere or the southern hemisphere, the, the temperate and, and polar climates, uh, really attractive in the summer because there's almost unlimited space and unlimited food for a few months. So the trip is difficult and risky, but um, the, it's like the, the deals on food and lodging are so good that it's worth making the trip. Um, the, 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 the really remarkable thing about this book, kind of stating the obvious, that it's also uh, also quite ambitious is uh, while you're writing what it's like to be a bird, you're trying to get into a bird's head. Uh, and, and I think it's in that introduction where you, you wrote about watching a, a, a bird that had completed building a nest and it stepped back and regarded it, its work. And you were wondering, you had this feeling the bird had a sense of, of pride. Yeah, I've, I've had this, this idea for a long time that, you know, the instinct, we think of instinct as um, a set of instructions coded in DNA. It's something that a bird is born with, the, the ability, the knowledge for how to build a nest or the sort of the, the set of instructions. So, but that, thinking of instinct that way makes it like a, like a, the bird is a robot. It's just, you know, the, the days get to a certain length that triggers the bird to um, build a nest. It starts gathering material and putting it together, but they can, they can make all kinds of adjustments along the way. They choose the location for the nest. They might try a few locations and then settle on one. They choose different materials based on whatever's available. And um, it, you know, the instinct has to motivate the bird to do those things. And I imagine that the motivation of instinct is, is feelings like pride and satisfaction. And that makes me think that the same, the same way we look at a freshly mowed lawn or a, a nicely weeded garden or, you know, the, the nursery room in your house um, freshly painted and ready for the new baby, those things make us feel good. And maybe that's the, the, the stirrings of instinct. Um, and the, I imagine that birds are probably being motivated by feelings like that. Um, they don't put it into words and talk to their therapist about it, but <laughs> they're, I think they're, I think birds can feel some something like pride and satisfaction, and it's also anxiety, fear, all those fundamental feelings. I think are are probably universal. For those of you who, who uh, may be joining us a little bit late, uh, we are talking with David Allen Sibley, the author of the Sibley Guide to Birds, Sibley Guide to Bird Life and Behavior, and the, this wonderful new book, What It's Like to Be a Bird. Uh, well, David, let, let's start talking about some specific birds. And uh, uh, we, we have a lot of great questions coming in, uh, and, but I'm going to indulge myself for the first few to uh, ask some questions, because I have you here at my disposal, uh, about, about bird behavior. Um, I'm, I'm not necessarily the biggest birder so much as I'm a backyard birder and I develop long-term relationships with, with a, a lot of, of my, my regulars here. People who know me know that I'm crazy about blue jays in particular. Oh, yeah. And uh, thanks to my being kind of loose with peanuts, uh, I've developed some, some pretty deep uh, friendships. <laughs> and I, I've seen some unusual things over the years that, that this is a perfect opportunity to ask you about. One has been more than once, uh, the blue jays that I've fed have brought me things, uh, acorns to, to be uh, <laughs> specific, yeah. almost like uh, a thank you for all the peanuts. A am I, am I, sorry for the pun, but I am, am I not? So is that what's happening? Yeah, that's, um, that is really interesting. That's, um, that behavior is well documented in crows and ravens that they, if you give gifts to a crow or a raven, it will start bringing gifts in return. Um, and and they, they kind of assign value to things. So if, if you give them something really good, they'll, they'll give you something that they consider really good in return. <laughs> and uh, I actually haven't heard of that in, in Blue Jays. It's, that's pretty sophisticated behavior. And um, uh, I haven't heard of that 
um, being known in Blue Jays, it's possible that I, I'm just not aware of the research, but that's fascinating. They're close relatives. Jays and crows are related, so it makes sense that that they would. And jays do a lot of really sophisticated things. Um, but that's fascinating. Oh, I, I'm, I'm so excited to tell you something that you hadn't heard before. Uh, <laughs> talking about, about jays and crows and, and uh, corvids, you know, crows and, and ravens, um, you, you uh, talked about that there are things that we, you know, a lot that I know has been learned about crows and ravens intelligence since the last time that you wrote a book, and that's something that you write about in uh, in, in this, which was kind of fascinating. Um, one of my favorite parts was that the Aesop's uh, fable about the thirsty crow. Uh, maybe yeah. you can tell that story, but it turns out the fable is not really fabulous. Yeah, yeah. So the fable is a, a crow finds a, a pitcher. It's a thirsty crow. It finds a pitcher of water, but the water is too deep in the pitcher for it to drink. And it, it goes around and finds rocks to drop into the water, which raises the level of the water up to where the crow can get a drink. And um, uh, researchers have, have tested real crows <laughs> recently with this same challenge, and they figure it out. And they understand, they understand the difference, the, the value of large rocks over small rocks. They understand that dropping wood chips into the water isn't going to help. They understand that if the pitcher is filled with sawdust with some tasty treat in the uh, resting on the sawdust that that dropping rocks in won't help um, and there's one uh, all all crows and ravens that have been tested i guess can can meet the challenge but one species from the island of new caledonia down in the southern pacific um, is particularly good at this uh, at this challenge and they say that that species shows an understanding of the problem that's equivalent to a, a five to seven year old human um, that they they just know uh, they understand the physics and the 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 relationship of all these different parts um, so really incredible stuff what's like a rune is maybe gotten paused for a minute with internet. I know that's always a challenge in this day and age. So let's move on to another question that we have. Um, Helen has a question, David, and it's, can you recommend a good online resource to get familiar with birds and bird songs in New England? Ah, um, well, uh, birds, bird songs is, so <laughs> there's some really good resources for, for learning about birds. The Cornell um, Lab of Ornithology has some great resources about um, basic information about birds. Um, and uh, if you, let's see, um, for learning about bird songs, that's more of a challenge. Um, there's a, um, trying to think. There's an app, an app, and a website called Larkwire that I know of that um, is kind of a training, um, a, a, a bird song learning tool. It it gives you games. So sort of like the the if you know the app Duolingo for learning language. It's it's something like that, but with bird songs. So you can sort of quiz yourself in different ways with bird songs, and it will it can be limited to just birds of a certain region. Um, so there's there's so much um, information now on the web, um, but those would be two good places to start, I think. Well, it's fascinating. Sounds like I've got some work to do. Um, I'm going to move on to another question. I know Arun's still having a little bit of trouble. Um, this is a question from um, Landon, age seven, and he would like to know how did you become interested in birds. Ah, well, I have always been interested in birds, as long as I can remember. Um, and my father's an ornithologist, so when I was a kid, there were lots of bird books in the house and uh, opportunities to see birds and to talk to people about birds. So my interest was, uh, was encouraged and, and uh, cultivated. Um, 
So I, I had lots of opportunities to, to do fun things with birds and but my interest in drawing went along with that. I, I was, I liked drawing. I think my, my interest in birds sort of came from my interest in drawing. Birds were one of my favorite subjects to draw when I was five or six years old. I liked taking my father's bird books off the shelf and finding um, pictures of birds and tracing or copying those. So was your father a big birder too, or? Yeah, yeah, he's um, uh, and so once I I got interested in drawing birds and and uh, and then he was taking me out on weekends to go for walks and and see birds in the wild, and uh, that was. You know that became really fascinating. So the two things really went together. I started drawing, and then my interest in birds uh, went out into the into the field. Um, it's wonderful. It sounds like a great way to get started. Um, so I'm going like, to take another question. I know Arun is still having a little bit of a, a challenge here, but just a reminder to the audience that if you have questions that you would like to ask David, you can just open up that Q&A tab at the bottom there and type your question in. We do want to know where you're from, so if you can include that in your question, all the better. And if there's a question that you see in that Q&A tab that you would like to hear asked, something that you are interested in knowing as well, you can vote for it. Just click that little thumbs up in the corner there. So hopefully Arun will be back in just a minute. Um, and in the meantime, we are going to go to Susan's question. It looks like a lot of you want to hear the answer to this. Um, David, Susan would like to know, there seem to be many more robins this year in eastern Massachusetts. Is that true? Or are they just taking over more territory because there are few men, fewer humans out and about? Ah. Um, well, if, uh, um, if I could ask a follow-up question, I wonder if you're, if you're thinking of robins in the winter or robins in the last few weeks, they, um, robins in the winter are really sort of nomadic. They wander around in flocks and find fruit that's left on trees and bushes. Um, so they can appear and disappear, sort of move into an area for six weeks and, and eat all the fruit and then disappear. Um, and one winter you might see huge numbers and the next winter almost none. Um, this time of year, I think um, if you're seeing more robins than normal now over the last few weeks, this is nesting season. They're already here in, I'm in Deerfield, Massachusetts, out in the western part of the state and there there are already robins sitting on eggs on nests here so they're well established on their territories and done migrating um, and uh, i think if you're seeing more now that would maybe be just as a result of um, uh, places being um, less populated by people um, uh, parks and lawns being open and the robins having uh, having the freedom to move around. And maybe also uh, the fact that you're, if you're staying in one place and, and just walking around your neighborhood, you're more likely to notice these things. Um, I'm hearing from a lot of people who are noticing birds now um, just because they're, they're staying local, staying in their yard or in their neighborhood and, and walking the same paths every day. Um, and that's when you really start to notice what's going on and what's changing each day. So interesting. I know that we have still, it doesn't look like Arun is quite back yet, um, but we have a special visitor. This is Craig Lamont, also from a newsroom. So um, Craig, I'm going to have you introduce yourself. Thank you so much for being here. I know that um, little backstory for everyone. This whole event came apart, came together because of Craig and a story that he had done. So. Welcome, Craig, and thank you so much for being here. It's fantastic to be here, and it's great to see you again, David. Um, as, as Abby said, uh, David and I had a chance to go for a, a bird walk together uh, uh, about maybe a, 
a month or so ago before before all the craziness really began, I think actually, and we were all stuck at home. And, uh, and it, was, it was such a wonderful story that um, I had done a three minute version for NPR, but on our website, you can find a, I think a 25 minute version of that story because there was just too much wonderful stuff to fit into something we could do on the radio. So it's wonderful to see you again, David, and thank you for doing this. I wanna go just directly to a question uh, that, that is uh, asked by uh, Nancy on our website which is something that I've always wondered too. She says, with their eyes on their side of their heads, why do birds not crash into trees as they zoom through the forest? It, it seems like over there, that would, that would be kind of tough. Yeah. Um, so yeah, their bird's vision is very different from ours in, in a lot of ways. So with the eyes on the sides of their head, it's an advantage for being able to see almost 360 degrees around them. They're seeing their entire surroundings all at the same time. And um, most birds have um, a few, um, one or two spots of, of uh, greater detail that they see with each eye. So in, in our eyes, we have one spot, we see one tiny spot of detail. One spot, one part of each eye um, sees detail. So if you if you look at one word in a sentence or on a computer screen and focus your eyes on that spot and try to read the words around it, you'll see just how small that area of detail is. So we're seeing one, both eyes focused on the same spot, one tiny spot of detail, and then a wide area of peripheral vision. The birds are seeing um, two or four um, spots of detail all sort of arrayed out in front of them and almost 360 degrees and in, in some species a true 360 degrees of peripheral vision the their entire surroundings all at once without moving their head um, so their their two eyes don't overlap much they have a small range of in front of them where both eyes overlap but they don't see much detail there and they use that mainly just for um, uh, sort of judging distance. Um, so they'll see, uh, if a bird is flying quickly through the forest, it will see, it'll be seeing everything in all directions, but seeing detail off to the sides mostly, and then seeing, um, being able to judge the distance to things that are directly in front of them. Um, and so they, they're not seeing great detail directly in front of them, but seeing enough, getting enough of a sense of, of what's approaching. Um, and then by, by turning their head just slightly, they can focus one of those spots of detail onto something. Um, and the other adaptation that really helps them in that is that they see, um, they process visual information uh, much more quickly than we do. So where we see moving objects as a blur, or we see a movie as a moving picture, because it's 30 frames per second and it's faster than we can process, the birds would see one of our movies as a slideshow. And when they're flying 20 miles per hour, dodging twigs in the forest, it's not a blur. They actually see the detail of everything that's coming at them and passing by. And so all of that together, allows them to navigate through the forest, even though the, their eyes are on the side of their head. That's incredible. Wow. And they, they would hate our movies. They wouldn't really understand yeah. the, uh, the whole thing. <laughs> yeah. uh, there's a question that, that I thought was a great one here from someone who said they've never seen an owl before. And I actually had not seen an owl before until fairly recently when uh, some took up uh, roosting behind my, my parents' house. And it was so exciting to actually see them because we hear them all the time. But this person said they haven't seen one before. And so often I hear them and can't see them. They asked for any tips on seeing an owl. Yeah. Um, well, obviously owls are active mostly at night. So going out at night is um, um, the best way to find them when they're active. But mostly you just hear them at night. Um, so learning what the common the most frequently seen owls sound like, um, and it's great horned owl and barred owl and screech owl are the three most frequent in Massachusetts. Um, learning what those sound like and going out at night to listen. 
Um, uh, and sometimes, especially great horned owls will sit up on a, on a prominent perch, like a, a, a tall, um, a big dead tree or a telephone pole or even the chimney of a house. They'll sit out in the open at, at dusk or dawn while there's still enough light to see them. So if you find an area where great horned owls are calling, you can try going back at sunset and uh, hoping that you'll uh, get to see one sitting out somewhere. Um, they spend the day roosting in secluded places, trying, hoping that they won't be discovered, um, sort of usually hidden in, in dense foliage or um, uh, even in a hole in a tree. Um, and there are, they're very sensitive to disturbance. So it's, um, it's uh, people are always reluctant to give away the locations if, if they've found a roosting owl. Um, it's generally not uh, advertised, not broadcast to the birding community where this owl is because they're, they're very sensitive to disturbance. The daytime is their time to rest. And if they're discovered and disturbed in their daytime perch, um, it's just a lot of extra stress for them um, and could be, uh, could be dangerous. But if you're um, sort of searching around, just checking out holes in trees, you might find a screech owl peeking out of one. Um, and uh, uh, looking into, if you know owls are in an area, looking into dense foliage, like in a spruce tree, um, looking for an owl perching in there. And one of the clues to one, an owl's favorite perch is that the, the ground underneath will um, build up a, uh, an accumulation of whitewash and uh, pellets. They regurgitate pellets of the undigestible parts of their meals. So if an owl has a favorite perch in a tree somewhere, you can see the signs on the ground underneath that and then look up into the tree and search through the foliage looking for an owl. And if you dig through those pellets, can't you actually find little skeletons of whatever it was the, the owl had for dinner? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So they, they regurgitate the fur and the bones, the, the parts that they can't digest. And um, researchers have done studies of owls' diets by, by gathering pellets, taking them apart and identifying the remains, the skulls of mice and shrews and... Um, birds and other things that the owls have been eating. That's great. Um, a question from Richard is, uh, I think a news you can use kind of question here. Should I clean out my backyard birdhouses after chicks fly? Um, I think that's a great question. When they're gone, you know, is it, is it better to clean it out and give a space for, for new nests to come in or do birds, you know, new, will new birds want to use what's in there? Yeah, I think the, um, uh, I did a little bit of research about that in, in working on my new book. Um, and it sounded like the, um, the jury's still out to some extent, that the, the thinking is that birds won't, generally won't reuse a nest. They'll build a new nest for each brood. Even if they have to build three nests in a season for three different broods, they'll build a new nest each time. Um, and the, the thought is that an old nest is more likely to be um, infested with feather mites or some other um, uh, nuisance. Um, so it's better to start fresh. Um, but cavity nesting birds like bluebirds, house wrens, tree swallows, the things that would use a birdhouse, their nesting sites are much more limited and they will reuse a box even if it has an old nest in it. They'll just bring in some new material and, and add that and I know at least one study found that there was no real preference or, and no real difference in the success of birds um, using a box that had an old nest in it or, or fresh. But generally the advice is to clean out the box after each season um, and uh, give the birds a fresh start. And if nothing else, it, especially with wrens, they, they <laughs> stuff the box full of so much so much material, sticks and grass, that the, it can get so full that it's, uh, it's impossible for another bird to get in there and, and build a nest. So 
clearing all that out at the end of the season and letting the birds start with a fresh box, I think is, uh, is generally the best advice. Great, okay. Another great question here. Uh, uh, Joe says, I'm curious about if there are notable interspecies rivalries among feeder birds or if some of the behavior we see is based on personalities of the individuals. He said, for example, the, the morning doves seem unbothered by everyone and blue jays seem to scare everyone else off. Um, uh, I, I had a chance to see your backyard bird feeder when, when we did that story uh, a month or so ago, and, and there's a lot of activity and a lot of different species there. What do you see in terms of, of how they're interacting with one another? Are there, are there uh, you know, extroverts and, uh, and, and grumpy uh, bird species as well? Yeah, yeah, there's definitely, um, each, each species has a personality in that way. The, some are more aggressive, like the blue jays, of course, and uh, blue jays just come bombing in, <laughs> calling and, and just launch themselves into the middle of the, the feeder action and scare everything else away. And it, it seems to be deliberate. And one of the theories, um, blue jays mimic the sounds of hawks. And one of the theories for why they do that is um, actually to to alarm other birds that are nearby and chase them away. So blue jays, they'll often fly into a tree over the bird feeder and imitate a hawk. Um, there's one uh, really interesting aspect of that, there's some new research, and I mentioned this in the book, that um, so downy woodpecker and hairy woodpecker are both um, common ac across the U.S. And um, they, um, they're very similar looking. Um, Downy's a little bit smaller and Harry's bigger, but the plumage pattern and everything about them is very similar. Um, but they're not particularly closely related. Um, and the recent research suggests that the downy woodpeckers get an advantage when other birds mistake them for hairy woodpeckers, <laughs> that they're kind of, um, imposters or they're they're kind of riding the coattails of the big the much bigger more powerful more more intimidating hairy woodpecker so the the thinking is that the the other birds at the feeder uh give the hairy woodpecker some space they have a lot of deference for it because it's a big strong uh powerful bird and um and then the downy woodpecker flies in and it gets at least some level of of benefit by being mistaken. It flies in and it's it's black and white in the same pattern as a hairy woodpecker and other birds kind of step aside and let it get some food. And that maybe the appearance of downy woodpecker has just continuously evolved to look like hairy woodpecker so that they can kind of tag along, <laughs> ride the coattails of their 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 big tough cousin. I think we have a rune back now. Actually, rune, are you there? Yeah. Now I'm I'm uh, un unmuted and uh, hi. <laughs> Hello. Sorry about the uh, technical difficulties there. Craig, good to see you. Good to see you too. Welcome back. We're delighted <laughs> to have you here. I'm take it from here, man. This is this is uh, this is your thing. Thank you. So I, I'm, unfortunately, I missed a lot of the conversation. So I, I, I will be uh, continuing to ask your questions as, as they're up there. But um, David, since uh, since I, I, I went away, um, let me uh, come back to my, my own indulgence. Let me ask you another Blue Jay question, if I could. All right. Because uh, I, I managed to find a new behavior for you. Here's another strange thing that, that I actually saw my, my Blue Jays do, which was um, feeding uh, chipmunks. Um, uh, with with uh, the, these peanuts that, that, that I've given them, they've seen me feed the chipmunks. But I I, I, I swear again, I'm I'm not going crazy. But these blue jays uh, I've seen go outside the the chipmunks' burrow and drop nuts right there. Wow, that that's amazing. <laughs> and they're <laughs> they're dropping nuts at at the chipmunks' burrow. Right there, yeah. And does the chipmunk come right out and grab the nuts? Seem pretty much, yeah. Wow. Wow. That's, uh, that's incredible. That's, uh, 
You've got some amazing blue jays. <laughs> <laughs> I might have to start taking uh, taking some some more film of them. Yeah. But, you know, David. One question I wanted to ask you, and uh, tell me if this is something that you you addressed, is that I'm really curious about how your artistic process works when you're painting. Uh, you know, it must be. Are, are you? You can't, you can't be working with live subjects necessarily, or do you go to get out there in the field and sketch with live birds? Yeah, I do a lot of sketching in the field, and I, I have, and that's what I did um, for uh, about 12 years straight in the, in the 80s into the early 90s. I was just in the field every day sketching, just doing pencil drawings. And, and, uh, um, and then when I'm back in the studio, I, I do all of my painting in the studio. So I'm, I'm looking at my pencil sketches, mostly for inspiration and just sort of refreshing my memory or um, revisiting my experiences and then using photographs as as reference material to make sure I get all the colors and markings and shapes right. Um, uh, but that's um, pencil sketching and and field sketching is really a critical part of all of it. The, the um, photographs are good for for checking details, but um, the photograph, an individual photograph can be pretty misleading. So all of my field experience and my, my sort of understanding of the birds that comes from sketching um, helps me to sort of interpret the photographs and turn that into a painting. How, how long does it take to get from the sketch to, to, to that glorious <laughs> stage? Um, yeah, so that a, a painting like that um, takes a, a few days. It's um, um, a few hours of working with pencil to just sort of get the get the shape that I'm looking for, the, get the outline right, and then I I have a an opaque projector. So once I have a pencil sketch that I like, I I put the sketch into the projector. It projects down onto a tabletop where I put the the sheet of paper I'm going to paint on. And I trace that sketch. I can adjust the size and then trace that sketch, the outline of that onto the paper. And I start with a pretty rough outline and then add all the details with paint. Um, so the painting, sort of building up the painting could take anywhere from two days to four days um, working on something like that. You know, one of the things that, that I love most about your, your paintings, that I, I feel like it's, it's hard to capture with, uh, with, with birds, is uh, this quality of a bird's eyes uh, that, that are, are unusual, very different from our, our own, and uh, somehow seems to reflect a certain amount of personality or, or character. And uh, I, I know when um, in cartoons, they, they, they'll, they'll cheat, even well-animated birds with feathers, they put human eyes in them to, to, con to be able to convey them. But, but you're, again, I mean, come, come to this, this beautiful great blue heron. Um, first off, is it, is it hard to capture that? And, and uh, how do you do it so well? <laughs> uh, it is hard, yeah. I think it's maybe the hardest thing about drawing birds and because it, it's so critical to getting the the image of the bird right um, that they all have each species sort of has a unique expression um, that depends on the the shape of the eye, the color of the eye, the the color of the feathers surrounding the eye, the pattern of those feathers, um, all of that, and the shape of the head. It all comes together to make a the bird to give that bird a distinctive appearance. And it's sort of their, um, you know, it's, it's each species unique look. And um, it's subtle, very, some very subtle details of the position of the eye, the shape, all of that stuff. And um, it just takes, um, you know, I, I guess I would have to say that it's just been a years of experimentation and practice that that <laughs> has uh, made me sensitive to those differences and and also um, how to draw them or how to what changes to make to fix something that doesn't look quite right. Um, and that all comes from years of just watching and sketching. Um, 
I think to some extent when I um, when I do a drawing or a painting, I'm kind of creating a reality, creating a creating something on paper, and it's easy to get caught up in that and not and and forget what the real thing is supposed to look like in a way. <laughs> so going back over and over, going doing a sketch and then going back to look at the real birds for weeks or months or coming back some time later to do another sketch and realize looking back at my old sketch that oh I didn't really didn't get that right I, it looked right at the time but it really doesn't look right now I'll try it this way that kind of years of experimentation and, and testing um, I think is where that that comes from I have an interesting question from uh, Suzanne from, from Concord, Mass, who uh, asks, is it a bad thing to play a bird call, such as a bluebird call, to try to encourage them to come to a feeder? Yeah, that's, that's the big question. Um, and it, um, I, I wrote about that on my blog about 10 years ago. Um, and the, it's, um, you are you're changing the behavior of the birds. So if you play a recording of a bird's song, it you are alter, going to alter that bird's behavior. They hear the recording, they think it's another bird. They come to investigate or to challenge or or whatever. Um, you're luring them out of cover, luring them away from finding food or feeding their young or preening or whatever else they were doing. So. It's a, it's definitely a disturbance and a disruption, and and could be um, significant in that way. Um, but recorded calls have also been used successfully in in a lot of places to attract birds to a, a new nesting area or um, things like that. The um, so. Uh, I'm not sure it would work to, especially this time of year, it would not probably not work to attract bluebirds to your yard, to your feeder. If, if they're, you want them to come for food, but this time of year, if you play a, a bird's song, it, the birds that hear that will think that there's already someone on territory there. So if you're if if a real bird has claimed that territory and hears your recording, it will come in looking for a fight, ready to drive off the intruder. If a bird is passing by and hears a song there, it will continue passing by thinking that place is already occupied. So this is definitely not the time of year to attempt that kind of experiment. Um, and I'm not sure that it would even work with bluebirds so it's it's a sensitive issue and and uh something that should be done with with a lot of care and thought um uh and to avoid any any real disruption or risk to the birds it, it's related to david to something uh, you've written about uh I, I believe that uh it's a controversy among among birders even i think it, it's, it, it's called fishing when when you uh try to do a call imitating a bird to try to attract that bird when, when you're out in the field yeah um uh pishing that's a making a sound like psh, 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 psh. and that that mimics the sound of a wren or a titmouse or a chickadee that has found a predator, found something alarming. So they make that sound when they're, they're trying to drive off a predator. And um, other birds hear that sound and come to gather around to, to see what the, what the alarm is all about and also to help drive off the predator. So if you mimic that sound, it will attract small birds. Um, and that that's generally accepted practice in birding. People have been doing that for a um, hundred years or more. Um, and the but birders are very sensitive to um, um, using playback. It's called recorded bird songs and playing that back to try to attract a species. Um, and it's it's really aside from being disruptive to the birds, it's very disruptive to other birders. So it's, it's really not recommended in any place where another birder could hear it, like a, a popular 
park um, or a refuge. Um, you imagine being out out somewhere on a trail and hearing the song of some unusual bird and moving down to that spot and discovering that no, it's just someone with a with their phone playing a recording of that species. Um, it's uh, it's distracting, it's disruptive, and it it in a lot of ways doesn't seem like playing fair because one person, the person who plays the song on their phone might get to see the bird when it comes out of the shrubbery, but no one else would. Hmm. Um, so it, it's, uh, it's considered bad etiquette for birding to, to do that in a place where there are other birders around. Um, I want to bring in now, we have a, a special guest. We're all loaded up with fantastic bird experts. Uh, Mark Faraday is uh, joining us. Mark has been the science coordinator at Mass Audubon's Wealthy Bay Wildlife Sanctuary uh, since for 13 years, since August of uh, 2007. Uh, he, he projects involve things from oysters and horseshoe crabs to bats and, and butterflies. Uh, pretty much all kinds of interesting animals. Any, any animals that I mean, that have the most fascinating kind of behavior. Uh, Mark seems like he, he is into it. Mark, it's good to have you with us. It's good to be here. This is fun. Um, so talk a little bit about um, what uh, you are most excited about right here in, uh, in, in Massachusetts right now uh, in, the, in the middle of May for our, our, our birds. Oh man, everything. Th this is the time. I mean, this is what birders wait for. Mid-May, <clears throat> this is when you know, the, those warblers that left us in the fall, all drab and confusing, they're now in their full breeding plumage. They're just popping. Um, you know, this is when we're looking to get our fix on some of these living jewels, you know, things like Blackburnian warblers. Um, and if we're paying attention, we can see these in our backyards. If you just have some, some oaks and, you know, just some, some shade trees, you can see these birds. Um, whether you're a hardcore birder or, or a backyard birder, there's something for everybody right now. You know, the, your casual backyard birders, um, we all love to see the Baltimore Orioles coming back. You know, I mean, what would spring be without seeing your first Baltimore Oriole, your first hummingbird? I mean, everybody's like, when is the first hummingbird going to be? And all of this stuff is happening right now. You know, with every passing day, new birds, <clears throat> new birds are arriving and ending up in your backyard. Um, it's just, it's the most exciting time. You know, shorebirds are coming through, everything is happening. You know, Mark, I, I, I was, I grew up in, in Maryland, spent years and years there, never saw a single Oriole. Here in Lexington, I've, I've got <laughs> one that comes through every year. That's just the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. Yeah, there are some that play baseball. I'm not sure um, people watch them much anymore though. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, I, I know even with um, some of the birds that, that are, are around most of the year, like uh, the goldfinches that, that I have that, that live right next to our house, uh, seeing those boys with, with, their, with their spring feathers, they're almost like, like different creatures. Right. And that confuses a lot of people. I, find, I get a lot of questions about goldfinches. I've seen active field birders for many years uh, say, hey, what's this thing at my feeder? And it's a picture of a, like a female goldfinch. Um, and so they don't tend to recognize them in the winter when there's sort of this grayish green color and kind of drab. And then they, they're they there all winter. And then when they turn yellow, all of a sudden people are like, oh, the goldfinches are back. Uh, well, they were probably there all winter. They're just, they're that intense glowing yellow now that we love to see. So what's, you, you're talking about some of your favorites. Is there a, a particular thing where you are? I think about where I am in Lexington. Uh, well, a couple of months ago now, though, it would have been like the Woodcocks doing their, uh, their song and dance uh, routine. Uh, for, for you, uh, what, what, is, is there one you could single out that's your, your most exciting uh, spring arrival or, or ritual? Oh, man. Jeez, I should have asked for the questions in advance. <laughs> well, <laughs> it's it's hard to choose. You know, this, and I prepared for questions like this. These are like the most common questions for, for bird people. Like, what's your favorite bird? And I, I never have an answer. It's amazing. I, you know, there, it depends on the day. Um, you know, for me, I work as a biologist for Mass Audubon and we manage beaches. So piping plovers coming back is an exciting thing, but it's also, um, you know, something that I do for work and, and something we take very seriously, protecting those beaches where they nest. So that's certainly uh, an important rite of spring here on Cape Cod, L late winter, really. Uh, they, show, they show up in mid-March. 
And so the piping plovers and American oyster catchers, like some of these Cape Cod, kind of iconic Cape Cod birds, and ospreys. I mean, we are kind of Grand Central Station for ospreys. Um, I'm working with a team of other biologists on uh, Massachusetts ospreys, but the Cape has so many more pairs of nesting ospreys than any other part of the state, um, especially places like Falmouth and Mashpee, you know, upper and mid Cape. Um, well, take, take, take a minute, Mark, because uh, for people who may not know the, the, this, this bird, <clears throat> this, this fantastic bird, like why, why, why do you, you like ospreys, right? Why? Well, everybody likes ospreys. <laughs> <laughs> um, they're just incredible. I mean, you know, people like big charismatic birds, let's face it. You know, it's not a sparrow. Sp <laughs> Sparrows are like birds only a birder can love. Uh, but you're talking about this kind of eagle-sized bird that they're very friendly. They're willing to nest out in the open where people can see them. They're willing to do all of their things that other birds do in secret, just right out in the open, the mating, raising their young, catching their food. I mean, you can watch them fishing and uh, coming up with herring and, and other fish this time of year. And it's a spectacular thing to see. The other aspect to it is the fact that it's a huge conservation success story. I mean, this is a bird, like before my time, you know, in the 70s, um, when I was five or six at the oldest, uh, you know, there was one place in Massachusetts where you would go to get the osprey, you know, the, West, the Westport River. Maybe there are a couple left on the vineyard, but really they were almost gone from the state and because of DDT. And so this, they have ties to the beginnings of the environmental movement and, you know, just like bald eagles and peregrine falcons um, and the pesticide DDT being banned. Once that was banned, they started making their comeback and now you're like swatting them away. And so it's a real um, success story of the environmental movement, how many ospreys there are now. And I think it's important to think about the fact that it was just a few decades ago that they were almost gone. So I think people respond to that. I feel like I've seen the same thing around here. This is just from, from eyeballing. Uh, and David, also happy to have you join in as, as well with um, red tail hawks uh, <laughs> around here that, that uh, it just, it seems like, you know, we don't use the phrase lousy with hawks because they're awesome. <laughs> There are so many now. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I know. They're causing problems at Fenway Park. And um, I mean, they love, they love cities. Uh, Red-tailed hawks have really um, adapted to cities quite well, um, you know, living on squirrels and pigeons. And when you look at the Christmas bird count data, um, it's an annual um, series of counts done all over the continent. Um, where people in December and early January go out and count all the birds they, they can in a 15 mile circle in one day. So the Boston count gets more red-tailed hawks than probably any count, I don't know, in the Northeast or certainly in, in Massachusetts. I mean, there are so many red-tailed hawks in the city. And so that's kind of a fun thing if you live in the city to have this, this element of wildness, this, you know, taloned predator <laughs> ripping apart squirrels outside your apartment. <laughs> You know, there's been a huge increase in red-tailed hawks in the last few decades. Um, just moving into suburbs and cities and, and pale male, the famous red-tailed in Central Park in New York City is um, part of that, that whole increase. And they've moved into parks in Boston and all through the suburbs. It's probably a combination of uh, the same, probably a, a little DDT um, recovery, same as Osprey, but also um, uh, less less hunting, you know, people, um, people shoot hawks or did shoot hawks as a, uh, you know, just sort of uh, habit persecution. And uh, there's a lot less of that. Um, that's the same way wild turkeys are moving into the suburbs and the cities with, with less hunting. Um, so yeah, it's just been an incredible increase in red-tailed hawks in the last 30 years or so. I just said uh, both of you, uh, they, they don't, I think, maybe get the, the love they deserve, but I, I love the local wild turkeys. Uh, and and though those toms in their glory, like they would put a, a male peacock, to, a peacock to shame. You yeah. love them because you're not a mailman. <laughs> <laughs> it's been well documented they're attacking mailmen. Um, but yeah, they, not everyone loves the turkeys, but I love them. I mean, they're like comic relief. Um, once they took over uh, where I work, Wellfleet Bay, Mass Audubon's Wellfleet Bay Wildlife Sanctuary, the jewel of the Mass Audubon system. Uh, 
<clears throat> we didn't have them until about five years ago, amazingly. So they had been on the Outer Cape for many years, Turo and places like that. And then once they got established, we were like, yay. And then they're just there. You know, they're under the feeders. They're around. They're looking, they're looking at me in my office window, just kind of like tapping on the glass sometimes. They're like comic relief. They're, they're, they're fun to have around. Um, not everybody likes them. They can kind of like tear up your yard for doing their dust baths and things like that. And, you know, you can imagine the size of their poop. So... <laughs> But um, it's it's been a nice it's been a nice recovery, and the state purposely reintroduced turkeys. They were pretty much gone from the state until Mass Wildlife reintroduced them. Every turkey on Cape Cod, for example, um, descended from birds that were released in 1993. I want to say hmm. New New York and Western Mass birds. So it's another it's another recovery. Um, and yeah. see, incredible success story. I have a, a fun Great. fact about wild turkeys that I, I included in my new book that they, all the domestic turkeys, um, all domesticated turkeys descended from um, the ones that were first domesticated in southern Mexico in like 2000 years ago. The, the Native Americans in, in Mexico had uh, domesticated the turkeys. So when the Spanish explorers arrived in the early 1500s, they found this giant exotic domestic bird and brought some back to Europe. And they were very popular and easy to breed, so they spread throughout Europe. And when the pilgrims left England to come to Massachusetts, they brought turkeys with them on the Mayflower. Domestic turkeys from Mexico. <laughs> <laughs> they brought some with them to Massachusetts and then were surprised to discover wild turkeys here in Massachusetts. And it was almost exactly a hundred years from when the Spanish brought turkeys back to Spain and they had uh, spread throughout Europe in farmyards throughout Europe and then were brought back to the back to North America uh, by the pilgrims. Also some turkeys with some very complicated lineages. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Mark, it's, it's been great having you uh, here. Uh, thank, 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 thank you so much, and, and um, got to get you on, on, on the show sometime as well. It's fun talking. Yeah, you. I'm available. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Bye, Mark. Uh, David, uh, well, first I want to get to another uh, listener question, uh, and, and this is a nice one. Uh, do we have any idea why Robin's eggs are, are blue? It would seem like that would be a color that might attract attention. Yeah, that's, that is a very good question, and I, I did not run across any any answer in my research um, and uh, yeah the the thrushes there's quite a few birds with bluish eggs um, robins and and the other thrushes have bluish eggs and catbird which is sort of distantly related in the same family as mockingbird um, also has uh, really bright or deep blue eggs um, it's an unusual pigment that is in those eggs, and um, uh, uh, but I didn't run across any suggestion in my research of why those eggs are blue. That's the kind of those why questions are the hardest ones to answer. Um, it is um, there's a, a lot of birds have spotted patterns on their eggs, a, a pattern of dark speckles and spots, and. Uh, I had always assumed that that was for camouflage, and it certainly is for ground nesting birds like killdeer, um, the piping plover, their eggs blend in with the sand or the gravel that they're, they're laid on. Um, but for most birds, it turns out that those dark spots are really to help strengthen the eggshell, and it's a substitute for calcium, which is a scarce resource that's difficult for the birds to get. So the the dark spots are the pigment melanin, which has it has the property of strengthening whatever material it's it's um, incorporated in. So um, a lot of birds have black wingtips. That's that's melanin in the feathers to help strengthen those feathers, and the wingtips are subject to a lot of wear and and uh, sunlight and all that. So those dark spots on eggshells, in most cases, are are to help strengthen the shell. Um, so the birds need less calcium in their, they, they can 
preserve a little calcium in their body instead of having to put so much into an eggshell. And it's possible that the whatever um, pigment, the, the blue color in Robin's eggs might have some property like that. It probably has nothing to do with how the eggs look, or it, I shouldn't say that. It might, uh, it might be something unrelated to how the eggs look. It might be something about strengthening the shell or some other property of the eggshell. I have a question about um, feeders. There was actually, I know this is answered in, in your book, so, so I, let me put it to you. I, I had been worried uh, at the back of my mind for a while about all the feeder birds that, that I have that um, making them dependent somehow on, on this food with all the peanuts that I give the blue jays, uh, goldfinches that seem like they do nothing but sit and, and eat thistle <laughs> all, all, all day. But uh, from what I read in your book, I, I, sh I shouldn't worry about that? Yeah, all the research that's been done um, shows that birds only use feeders as a supplement. Um, even uh, one of the most important studies on that question was done, I think, in Wisconsin at some bird feeders at a state park that had been filled continuously for something like 30 years. So generations of birds had grown up with these feeders and, and visiting constantly. Um, the researcher took the feeders away periodically and, and monitored the local bird populations to see how the birds were faring. And um, it turned out that none of the birds were using the feeder for more than 50% of their food. And when the feeders were taken away, the birds went, they could find all they needed um, in the wild. Um, and the other thing is that when, when birds are raising young, they instinctively um, find other really high quality food for their young. Um, and chickadees, I highlight this in the book that the Chickadees feed their young mostly insects, insect larvae, especially little green inchworms, things like that. Um, but for the first week after the chicks hatch, the adults are seeking out spiders in a higher proportion. And spiders are apparently high in taurine, which is an essential nutrient um, good for brain development. So the chickadees, the adults might be visiting your bird feeder to to get food for themselves, just to get a quick snack. And then they go off into the forest and they gather spiders and caterpillars and bring those to the, the chicks back in the nest. So they're very, uh, uh, the, your, your bird feeders really, uh, you can rest easy. <laughs> You're not making the birds dependent. They're not gonna uh, be eating a poor diet or, or uh, having, having any issues with the food that you're offering at the feeder, they'll, they'll use it just as much as they need to or as much as they want to and no more. I have a great question from David who wants to know, what are the most endangered birds in New England and what habitats do they like most? Mm. Um, oh, that's a, yeah, an interesting question to limit it to New England. Um, they're, um, uh, I'm sure there are a few species with only only a handful of breeding pairs in the in New England, um, but most of those species would have healthy populations or larger populations el elsewhere. It's just that New England is near the near the edge of their range. So I would say bird like piping plover that that Mark mentioned, um, a large percentage of the global population nests in Massachusetts. Massachusetts is really the the most important state for piping plover and um, New England um, even more. Um, and the world population of piping plovers is only a few thousand birds. So that is a globally really, really endangered bird. Um, I'm sure there are, for almost everyone listening to this program, there are more people in your town than there are piping plovers in the world. Um, and another species that is really of great concern now is um, a little sparrow that lives in salt marshes and it's called appropriately salt marsh sparrow. Um, it's limited to salt marshes along the coast from about Virginia north to uh, um, New Hampshire. And with a lot of changes that have been going on in salt marshes 
and and now um, especially the projected sea level rise um, they're, they're having a hard time nesting their whole their whole nesting cycle depends on correlating with the tide cycles um, so the the highest tides on the new moon um, they build their nest just a couple of inches higher than that that highest tide and um, so their their they, numbers have been declining and and their uh, that species is projected to be extinct in in the next 30 years or so just because their habitat is changing so quickly so that that one is probably the most endangered bird in New England just because they're uh, they're they're on a on a downward spiral and there's not not much uh, relief in sight you know that that that, that brings me to kind of a, a, a big thought that I, I got out of your book that there's a phrase in in this book that uh, in variations I feel come comes up uh, quite a bit which is that everything is connected uh, and, and from from things as, as uh, strange as bird guano affecting cloud formations in Antarctica to uh, birds relation to trees relation to salmon runs um, what was that an expected theme to come up in the writing it was it was something that I wanted to highlight um, I think that for me that's learning those connections discovering and making those connections is one of the most rewarding things about learning about doing the research so i really wanted to wanted to make those connections and highlight them in the book that was a conscious uh, a conscious thing um, yeah it's uh it and it's amazing like the i mean the salmon moving nutrients upstream and the same with um, the seabird colonies seabirds are bringing fish from hundreds of square miles of ocean and then um, depositing that <laughs> that material onto a little island the island becomes a real uh, really rich in nutrients because it's been fertilized by all of these birds gathering fish from fish and other marine organisms from hundreds of square miles and uh, so if, if the seabird colony disappears, the whole ecology of the island changes fundamentally. The plants and everything else would change because the seabirds are not bringing in fish anymore. Well, it's, um, again, I, I, I can't state enough what a marvelous, I'm just gonna hold it up again. Uh, this is, you've given us a really wonderful thing here, David. Um, Thank you. It, it's, uh, Again, I, I think I said at the outset, I didn't know that there would be so much more to learn about birds that you hadn't already covered in, in, in your work. And, and it's, it's just incredible. Um, again, you can find this, uh, you can get a Kindle version of this, but you, you, want, you want the real book. You, you, you want this thing. The, the paintings are just, uh, just gorgeous. And um, David, it's been such a treat to, uh, to, to speak with you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Arun. It's been a pleasure. And uh, maybe stick around if you can, because we are shifting to, as I, as I promised, we have a, a, a bird quiz for all of you to, uh, to join in on. Uh, we're going to have play sounds from four different five different birds and uh, see if you can guess. So here we go. You can see there on your screen, we'll uh, have some clues for you. Uh, bird number one, uh, these birds are usually easy to find throughout much of North America, except in deep forests. Their potato chip flight call draws attention to them in open country, and they're abundant in places with thistle plants near feeders. Bird number Anybody get that? I, I think I think we're we're getting some uh, responses. Make sure you turn up the sound on, on on your computer. Potato chip. 
That is uh, the American goldfinch. Uh, we have loads of these out, out, outside. Uh, actually, right outside my window, I can even see one right now. Uh, very lovely birds, fun to have around, and they do love that, uh, that thistle seed. All right, next candidate. Remember to uh, turn up your sound for those of you playing at home. Everybody's playing at home. Bird number two is the quintessential early bird. They're, they you can see them on lawns across North America. Uh, I've got a pair of them right here uh, in, in, in my yard here in Lexington who are about to uh, raise a family. Very popular for their warm orange breasts, considered lucky in some places. They have a cheery song and uh, they're familiar as town and city birds, but they also do well in wilder areas as well. Here we go, bird number two. Recognize that? That is the American robin. Uh, who doesn't love robins? They're, they're, they're wonderful birds. We have a pair that has been, has raised successful young for three years in a row now at, the, at, at, our, at our house here. Beautiful birds, American robin. That's a great picture too. All right, bird number three. It's an active little bird, familiar in feeders and parks, woodlots. Uh, they, they, they tend to uh, blend in with other birds, with flocks of chickadees and nuthatches, and right around the same size. They don't really outsize them. They're an acrobatic forager, a black and white bird. They're, they're distinctive. You can see them at home on tiny branches or balancing on plant galls, seed balls. And they're actually one of the first identification challenges that the beginning bird watchers master. And if, if the song didn't give it away, uh, probably the, the, the tapping gave you a pretty good clue that that is a woodpecker, in this case, the downy woodpecker. One of, one of these uh, lovely creatures uh, tried to make a home in the siding of our house a couple of years ago. Uh, but aside from that, they're pretty great to have around. Uh, bird number four. Uh, the bird almost can universally considered cute thanks to its oversized round head, tiny body, and curiosity about everything, including humans. This is not going to be a hard one. These birds have a black cap and bib, white cheeks, and uh, have a whitish underside with buffy sides that is distinctive. And they're, they're, they're very curious birds will hang around your feeder. And uh, here's another clue. It's a bird that says its own name. Here we go. Yeah, one, one of our favorites. That is, of course, the black-capped chickadee, or, uh, or as he would say, chickadee dee dee dee. Um, one more to go. I think everybody's doing pretty well on this. All right, bird number five, a common feeder bird uh, with clean black, gray, and white markings. They're active and agile with an appetite for insects and large meaty seeds. They get their common name from their habit of jamming large nuts and acorns into tree bark, then whacking them with their sharp bill to hatch out the seed from the inside. There's a pretty big clue. The birds may be small, but their voices are loud and you can often hear their nasal yammering that'll lead you right to them. Yep, combine nut and hatch, and you have the white-breasted nuthatch. Uh, another bird that uh, I got to say, all of these are birds that I know very well. Uh, frequently come to uh, to our feeders and visit us here in Lexington. Well, that is it. You all did very well. It's it's been uh, just fantastic to. Uh, 
to, to be able to do this with all the participants and with all of you. I mean, uh, hundreds of people joining in who are enthusiastic about birds. Uh, it's, a, it's a pretty wonderful thing. Uh, sorry about the technical problems, but everything went really well. Thanks to Craig Lamolt for, for jumping in and helping out and everybody involved. Uh, I want to mention one more time David's book, What It's Like to Be a Bird. It, it's, it's a beautiful book uh, and it's, it is just wonderful. Thank you so much to David Allen Sibley and uh, all of you for, for joining us. This has been great fun. Uh, have a great time birding. Thank you.